there's a lot of really challenging features about something as audacious as sending a mission to Mars. I will retire really happily if we find that there's life on Mars and probably with a Nobel Prize because we, you know, this is one of the holy grails of science to actually see whether there could be life anywhere else in the universe. Over four billion years ago, Earth and Mars looked very different. Mars was a water world, blue and full of lakes and rivers, while Earth was a dusty, lifeless planet, an atmosphere filled with carbon dioxide. Then everything changed. Mars lost its magnetic field, which exposed it to the sun's radiation. This, coupled with the so-called late heavy bombardment of asteroids, saw its seas evaporate and its surface freeze, changing Mars forever. Meanwhile on Earth, life flourished. For decades, humans have struggled to reveal the secrets of the Red Planet. There are signs there could have been life on Mars. And now, this rover is going where none have gone before, underground, to hopefully uncover the answer to the question, has there ever been life on Mars? Between August and October 2022, Earth and Mars come into a favourable window of alignment, when the journey takes the least amount of time and fuel to reach Mars a time that happens only every 25 months. Then the Rosalind Franklin rover, named after the DNA pioneer, will be launched on her own journey of discovery. Abby Hutty, the lead structures engineer, and physicist Professor Andrew Coates have worked for a decade to be ready to take the next step in space exploration. I do dream about Mars occasionally and what we, uh, you know, what we might get on the surface and uh, once we've got to the surface is it going to work or not. But, um, but yeah, I mean with these things you, uh, it's a risky business. It's high risk and high reward because when we get to the surface correctly and, uh, and start drilling to look, look for signs of life on Mars it will all be worthwhile. Personally I think there is probably life elsewhere in the universe and possibly elsewhere in our solar system but whether we find it with this mission or not is maybe a, a more um, complex question. The engineers and scientists had no margin for error. The conditions on Mars are extreme and hostile for any visitor from Earth. Abby, we know how harsh the conditions would be for a human being on Mars, but it's thrown up a lot of problems for engineers and designers too, hasn't it? Yeah, actually one of the big things that we struggle with, it sounds silly, but it's the temperature on Mars. It's mm -hmm. so cold on Mars. So it can get to minus 130 degrees centigrade at night on Mars, and it rarely gets hotter than about five or 10 degrees during the day. But also it fluctuates really dramatically day to night. So that daily fluctuation in temperatures can be really challenging from our structures. And radiation, I yes. guess, as well. So on Mars, you're not protected with a, a big magnetic field or a, a strong atmosphere like we have here on Earth. So that's for our electronics is really challenging. It means that you get lots of false positives in your code, bit flips and things like that that we have to watch out for, detect and correct for before um, they do any damage to the signals that we're transmitting. This is an incredible facility, but is this, how close is this to the conditions on Mars? So this facility is designed to be visually very close to what we're experiencing on Mars. And that means that when we're developing that autonomous navigation, we're getting the right kinds of images and we've got the right kinds of terrain to navigate through. Airbus Defence and Space UK was the lead builder. They tested prototypes here in the Mars yard. So Abby, this is a prototype of the Rosalind Franklin, and that is the rover that will be going to Mars, but not this one. <laughs> yeah, so we call this one Bruno. So we've been using Bruno to develop the autonomous navigation system. So meet Bruno. <laughs> he looks a little bit like the Rosalind Franklin rover. We use him in this facility to take the right images with his cameras, to get the right kind of contrast and images back into his computers. And <laughs> he's watching us. <laughs> he is. Uh, and then he will be able to perform all of the drives, so he's got all of the right locomotion system and wheels on board. For life as we know it to exist, you need water. There was great excitement in 1877 when astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli identified channels and called them canali, 
which was mistranslated into canals, implying there was not only life, but intelligent life on Mars. This inspired Professor Percival Lowell, who also believed he could see a network of artificial canals. Sadly, it's now thought that both men were deceived by images of the blood vessels in their retinas, reflected in the telescope lenses. These wheels look rather clever contraptions. Yeah, so this is one of the things about sending a mission to Mars, is that if you're looking for life, you don't want to contaminate Mars with Earth life. So that means that all of the materials that we make the rover out of have to be inorganic in nature. So we can't use rubber, rubber comes from trees, um, that's an organic molecule that would maybe give us a false positive if a, a bit broke off and got into our samples. Since 2012, NASA's Curiosity rover has searched the red barren Earth for signs Mars could have supported microbial life. But it's hoped the Rosalind Franklin rover will be the first of its kind to go deeper. Given that all the conditions were right, there's every chance that there was life on Mars, just like the beginnings of life on Earth. But what we're looking for is the proof that that's the case. So just around here is the mechanical workshop. So Professor Coates from University yeah, College it's... London has been the principal investigator on the rover's panoramic camera. So this is the prototype. Well, this is a model of what the actual thing looks like. So okay. it's not a working model, no. uh, but it's just the right shape and right color and all that with the right paint on it. Yeah. So it's exactly what it looks like on the top of the Mars to the rover. Looks like we've got three cameras here. Yeah, so we've got uh, at each end, there's two wide angle cameras. So those are separated by further than the human eyes are. It actually stands about this height above the surface of Mars, two meters above the surface of Mars. So it sort of looks around um, and with the two eyes, you get better 3D than we can do with our human eyes. Oh, okay, and that, um, so that's spacing them further apart like that? Yeah, that allows you to do that. So you get a better better 3D digital elevation model of the area near the rover. So as well as those two cameras, there's a high resolution camera. So that's a zoom camera, which sort of looks at a particular rock and gets great detail. So with that, we can get a color picture, but we can also look at um, the reflectance spectra from the rocks. And so what that gives you is what the rocks are made of. So looking particularly for water-rich minerals on the surface of Mars, and we're going to drill up to two meters underneath the surface to look for signs of life. So this, the, the results from this instrument will be really important in choosing where to drill. The drill's potential is causing great excitement. It's the biggest development in the search for life. Up until now, Curiosity has only been able to dig six centimeters. We know that the surface is so bombarded with radiation that actually you wouldn't be able to find life at the surface. Because it's been wiped um, away. It would have been so badly deteriorated just from that radiation that even if it had been alive at the surface, you wouldn't even be able to recognise it as having been life. So our drill can actually drill up to two metres below the surface, wow. so like taller than us, so but below the ground. OK, so this is not two metres long, so yeah. where are you hiding two metres of drill? So there's four segments inside this drill here. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like a pile driving machine, so it flips up to vertical, rotates one, drills into the ground, and then the next one slots in, and then drills that Clever. into the ground, slots in, and keeps going. And then you can bring back your sample from anywhere in the height of that. It doesn't just have to be from two metres, it can be from anywhere in that column. Um, you've got a camera on board that can take images so that you can tell if there's maybe a different coloured soil or um, if there's a particularly interesting thing that you want to analyse rather than somewhere else in the column. The drill is part of a suite of nine instruments on board, which have been put together by different teams in multiple countries. Run purely on solar power, a plug of plutonium will be inserted just before launch to keep the instruments warm. All will work together to crack Mars secrets. So the cameras are working in tandem with the radar to figure out the very best place to look for signs of life. Yeah, so we have several context instruments. So these between them are getting the context of the position where we're going to be drilling. So we're working, you know, this is the main camera system. So it's getting the surface geology. There's also an infrared spectrometer, which uh, looks at one pixel of the high resolution camera and gets a very good infrared spectrum from that. There's also a subsurface ra sounding radar, which allows you to look underneath the surface and look for rocky outcrops and places to drill. There is also a neutron detector to look at um, water underneath the surface. But we're using this data with all the other context instruments to decide where to drill. So then we get to drill underneath the surface, get the sample, 
bring it into the analytical drawer on the rover and then use three instruments to look for signs of life. Inside the rover there's an onboard laboratory and so there's something called the analytical drawer. So there's something which looks at mineralogy, there's something which looks at, uh, you know, could they be organics? And I think the star of it is going to be the Mars Organics Mass Analyzer, which is going to be looking for carbonates and um, looking for amino acids, that sort of thing, the building blocks of life. So all in all, we're building up a picture of what conditions were like, what habitability was like, and actually going to the heart of the question of was there life on Mars? Since the first mission launch in 1960, our technology has improved, but the failure rate has been high. Around half of the missions have not been completed. I think the launch day is going to be quite an emotional one, if I'm <laughs> completely honest. Um, Terrifyingly emotional. Yeah, I'd, I'd quite like to be hiding behind my sofa on that day, I think. Um, a rocket launch is never without risk and it's something that we have absolutely no control over mm. here in Stevenage. So we just have to kind of cross our fingers and hope for the best. Um, and engineers like control. <laughs> I particularly like control, so that's one of the things that I'm going to find the most challenging, <laughs> yes. The rover will travel millions of kilometres over eight months before entering Mars atmosphere. In 2012, NASA dubbed Curiosity's landing sequence the Seven Minutes of Terror as the 900-kilogram rover went through a complicated sequence of manoeuvres to touch down. Rosalind Franklin is only a third of the weight but has just as far to fall. So with our mission we have um, heat protective um, tiles on the, on the spacecraft as it ploughs into the thin Martian atmosphere but stops it burning up. And then there's parachutes which come out. This mission includes the biggest ever parachute sent to Mars, so that has just got to work. It glides down on the parachute through the atmosphere. And then the rover gets released from that, and there's a retro rocket system which drops away from the parachutes. And that stops the thing and sort of hovers almost as it tries to actually get to the surface of Mars. So there's lots of things with all of that which can go wrong. There are millions of components in these things. But the most risky bits are the launch and then, in particular, the landing on Mars. The rover is the second of two ExoMars missions, a programme run by the European Space Agency and the Russian Space Agency, Roscosmos. The first mission launched the Trace Gas Orbiter, which is looking for gases around Mars and for water in the atmosphere. It will also assist the rover to phone home when it begins to gather data from its landing position. So this is a globe of Mars, and Mars is an amazing planet. The colours on this actually give you altitude um, uh, above, the, above, the, above a, a nominal level. So it's going from blue, which is very low, through to reds and whites, which are really high. But where we're going to land actually is, um, is uh, this point here. Um, so this is Oxia Planum. So the reason for choosing this one in particular is it, it was covered by water for longer than other features on Mars, yet it's very near the sort of boundary between the ocean. And so um, we have to land somewhere near the equator to, because of the solar panels of, on the mission to, to have enough power. But this place has been chosen as a wonderful spot to land. Before the rover can be launched, it must be assembled in a sterile clean room to wipe away any earthly particles. Then there's further testing in France to make sure it can endure the rigours of the mission. Finally, it will travel to Kazakhstan for launch on a Russian Proton rocket. When it lands, the rover will have limited opportunities to find life. It's only designed to operate for around seven months and drive four kilometres. Then the Rosalind Franklin's mission will be over. On Mars, she will remain. Rather than looking at it from an engineering point of view and a science point of view, looking at the big picture of its going into the solar system. Yeah, and it's been a big part of so many people's lives. You work on it for such a long time. Of course, you kind of build a bond to it and you personify it. And like it you say- It is your baby. <laughs> um, 
you want to see it find love, you want it to, <laughs> to find happiness, all of these things. It does feel like a member of the family almost and then you're sending it into the big bad universe and hoping that it does well and it's going to send you back um, exciting postcards of its new life on Mars. <laughs> Because if we have life on Mars, that gives us a clue that life would then be widespread. Because we're finding out now about extrasolar planets, planets in other solar systems, and so the possibility of life there becomes even more possible. I think the big question is, are we alone in the universe? Is there life elsewhere in our solar system? And they're the ones that I would really love to be part of the team that found the answer to. I think that would be phenomenal. As long as Mars blinks down at us from the night sky, our desire for answers will never fade. Neil Armstrong talked of one small step for man when he walked on the moon. If life on Mars has or does still exist, that would be our next great leap in space exploration. Ah, oh, it's finished. But don't worry, we've got a lot more Razor stories for you. All you need to do is like, comment and subscribe and hit the bell button below for notifications. We'll see you next time.